Okay, so we're going to continue with the PA system part two from the last, uh, uh, from last week. And uh, let me just... Uh, yeah. All right. Okay, and here, Victor in Victor. All right, so PA system part two of two. All right, so here is um, um, here's the aspect of uh, another aspect of um, dealing with the PA systems. Um, uh, mostly, this would be like a stage gear. Now, stage gear also would be considered uh, things like. Uh, uh, well, the good old rock and roll type of a uh, uh, setup, uh, which would be you know, a stage with uh, uh, you know, the drum set, which would be uh, maybe about six microphones or more. Uh, then it would be a bass guitar kind of a feed. And sometimes the bass, you get the direct feed from the bass guitar. And sometimes you get the uh, uh, feed from a microphone that is pointing at the bass amplifier. All right. Or sometimes it's both. Uh, and now uh, then you know guitar or two, maybe a keyboard. And guitar is also is a popular setup that you get a guitar co connected to a amplifier, guitar amp that just stands on the stage. And then you have a microphone pointed uh, at the at the amplifier. And then that's how you get the sound uh, to the mixing board. All right. Now. <clears throat> This is uh, one of, uh, it's a picture, I got this thing from the internet, you will get the references uh, from that. Now, uh, this is a uh, big stage that I think it takes them about a couple of weeks to set up. And this is the New Year's Eve in, uh, in a place that is called Zakopane, Poland, all right? Um, now, every year, New Year's Eve, uh, that's what it is. And uh, once, uh, once those guys are done with that, it looks like this, all right? So uh, from that, from that to this. So it takes a lot of coordination to uh, to set up the uh, stage gear like this, okay? Uh, now, what is involved? This is the um, live performance type of a typical stage setup. So what, uh, what we have here, we do have a mixing board, which would be the signal processor. We do have a microphone on the stage and uh, you know a guitar plugged into something that's called a DI box, uh, direct box, um, direct input box, and um, uh, or direct interface. Uh, and then uh, we what we have uh, also we have some sort of uh, uh, effects plugged into the mixing board that the effects could be patched into the channels uh, accordingly, and uh, we have. Um, stage monitors here and the stage monitor amplifiers so most of the amplifiers you're going to find on the stage and the reason for that uh, why we why we install amplifiers on the stage so the mixing board could be at the front of the house and uh, front of the house is called like foh okay so front of the house um here's the stage uh, well, let me just uh, yeah okay so here is the stage for example, that's where the musicians are and all that stuff. Here's the public, okay? And this would be a setup here. That's where the mixing board would be. So this would be called front of the house. Okay? And then there's a stage. So the amplifiers would be underneath the stage or backstage. So the signal will be fed from the mixing board into the amplifiers that are backstage or at the front stage or around the stage area there. And they will be powering up the speakers that uh, uh, that uh, shoot back to the to the public, okay? Uh, why is this thing being done uh, this way? Is because, uh, let's say the line level signal, the, the link would be um, around 600 ohms, 1000 ohms uh, impedance. Uh, now, uh, so if you have uh, a link that is maybe 100 feet or 200 feet long, uh, it's going to add maybe one ohm, two ohms to the whole uh, to the whole link there. So you know, 600 ohms plus two is like 602 ohms. Not that much of a difference. But if you have a speaker, or a couple of speakers that are maybe eight ohms or some quite often it's going to be four ohms. So if you have a speaker wire, even thicker wire. So if you have four ohms and add the length of the wire, which would give you maybe one and a half ohm, maybe up to two ohms. So two ohms comparing to four ohms, uh, it would be it would make a difference. So that's why 
we tend to mic uh, to mount, mount the amplifiers right on the um, uh, right on, in the stage area. So the wiring that is powering the or connecting the amplifiers to the speakers is the shortest as possible, as short as possible. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's get rid of this here. And uh, as far as uh, stage, some stage terminology, stage left and stage right. Where is stage left and where is stage right? If you are standing on the stage facing the public, that's how you, uh, that's how you count the directions, okay? Um, if you're facing the public, to your right-hand side is stage right, to your left-hand side is stage left, but you're seeing the mirror image right now. So, uh, okay, let me just uh, think about it. Okay, this is my left hand, but it looks like my right hand. So this will be stage right. If I'm facing the public, this will be stage left if I'm facing the public, okay? So uh, that's how we... Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then there's upstage and downstage. Uh, there's a terminology that says, uh, usually in the theater terminology, up. Uh, uh, you, you can hear that actors are saying to another actor, I uh, will be say, uh, you are upstaging me. Okay. So up is towards the public and down the stage is the, uh, away from the public. So if somebody is upstaging somebody, that means they're standing in front of them. Okay? Uh, all right, let's keep, uh, let's, uh, get, get back to this, uh, here. Now, uh, just a typical uh, mixing board configuration. Uh, what do we have here? We have uh, something that's called a three, three prong XLR um, inputs, uh, which would be the balanced microphone line, uh, microphone level signal here. And remember, the balanced signal is, uh, you know, uh, it has uh, a middle reference or ground reference, or sometimes it's virtual ground. You should know that from the op amp amplifiers and the differential amplifiers. So there's that uh, uh, ground reference, and there's a positive and there's a negative uh, uh, cycle of the signal, and they are being shot through the line simultaneously 180 degrees out of phase. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. When it gets to the differential amplifier, it's recognized as a signal. If there are two, uh, if those two are in phase, which would be, uh, if there's a spike, that would be in phase. So those spikes are in the noise that is interfering with the signal. It will be in phase, so it will be ignored. So that's why balanced uh, links are, uh, you know, I consider quite uh, quiet lines because the noise is just being ignored by the differential amplifier. So uh, here is the, uh, uh, this is a very small mixing board. You can pick it up probably on Amazon for like 60 bucks or maybe up to a hundred, uh, depending on the features that they get. So this is, there are two channels uh, here. And then there's a line level signal as well. So here is the one millivolt peak to peak kind of a signal balanced. And this would be a one volt peak to peak uh, unbalanced. So uh, you would plug in a keyboard, uh, which would be on the stage somewhere over here, or maybe some, some effect. You will plug into these inputs here. And uh, this is a quarter inch um, and it's a it's an automatic disconnect. So if you plug this one in, the internal physical construction of that jack is going to disconnect the balance uh, input here. So there is no interference from the other uh, signal. Right? And then you have something that's called a gain. And uh, this gain uh, input or the control um, sets the signal to a level that is going to be comfortably adjustable by the volume of this strip. And you have a little light EQ here, uh, equalizer. This one only has highs and lows. All right? And uh, over here, you have something that's called uh, uh, auxiliary input. So if you plug something into the auxiliary input, uh, wherever that is, I can see it here. Uh, can I see it here? Auxiliary send, auxiliary receive, you know, sometimes you gotta read the manual on how to. So if you plug in the auxiliary inputs, uh, you can, um, uh, you can send, you can, uh, you can control that, mix it in with this type of, a, with this one strip. Uh, so you might want to get some effect uh, uh, coming in strong onto this strip here but you don't want any of that into this strip. And over here you have the main volume control. So it raises the, like you set up the proportions with the channels here and uh, you have the main 
uh, volume control for the one uh, main output. And then over here, you have something that's called a monitor output. And sometimes if you want to do stereo, you could just use monitor as left and the main output as right, and you get the stereo output, okay? But usually when it comes to um, big open air um, um, concerts or stage setup, uh, or even a closed room, like a big hall of, uh, you know, that sits about 200 people or so, then the stereo doesn't work. Usually stereo is not implemented in some special cases, maybe uh, uh, with some special effects. But uh, if it's, uh, uh, if it's uh, usually those type of setups involve a mono type of a setup. So don't even bother with some of the stereo unless there's some special case, okay? Uh, so this one main would be uh, controlling the front of the house speakers. And this would be controlling the stage monitors and the stage monitors are the speakers on the stage pointing towards the artist's face. So in the monitor speaker, what you have, what kind of signals you have, well, whatever you want there, you might, if it's a keyboard player sitting there and has a, then that person has a monitor uh, speaker pointing at them, uh, you would give through the monitor, you would send whatever that person needs to hear comfortably uh, uh, the other musicians playing and maybe uh you know if it's a uh, you know if, if that person sings as well so you could hear you could you could direct some of the uh some of that person's voice onto that monitor so they can hear themselves comparing the uh um uh, comparing with the other musicians because on the stage the musicians hear com completely something different than what's on the front of the house it's almost like two complete worlds uh if you didn't have the stage monitors you would uh, you would just hear tumble type of reflected noise, uh, and you would not you would have a, a very difficult time uh, at, you know, playing your music just to hear something that reflects from the back walls and uh, and whatnot. Okay. Uh, also, there is an, another common practice uh, uh, which would be which would involve another channel because you know you wouldn't be able to do this with this uh, with this uh, mixing board. It's uh, called stage fill monitors, and those stage fill monitors usually are towards the side at the stage uh, uh, level, uh, and they're pointing towards the stage. So that and what is being fed in there is just like overall mix of the whole thing, what's happening uh, uh, as far as the music is being played. So the musicians on the stage have a feel of actually what's going on and they can be comfortable as possible on the, uh, on the stage. Also, there's another way of monitoring uh, right now for some years being used, and it's called the in-ear monitors. You put it inside your ear, so they're called in-ear monitors. Uh, and uh, quite often, you're going to see some of the artists uh, performing uh, live. You're going to see those uh, those ear uh, plugs in there. So that's what, the, what happens. The, those ear plugs are molded. Um, uh, towards the person's ear shape inside the ear and they are being plugged in and the idea is to cut off pretty much almost 100 uh, percent of the environment uh, that's that's there so they don't hear anything that's you know uh, if this thing was not plugged in anywhere that person would not hear anything well you hear a little bit right but uh, that's the idea okay and then there's a separate mix so there'll be a front of the house mixing board to uh, to direct the or the, to adjust the levels that are going towards the um, towards the front of the house for the, for the public and uh, the signal all the signals would be split using um, something that's called this signal splitters or split snakes in analog uh, the signal is being split via transformers so you have one primary for the input from the, whatever the source is, the transducer, for example, microphone. And that transformer is basically um, uh, 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 sending the main signal. And then, uh, um, oh my God, this office was so quiet. And as soon as we started the lesson, the whole thing started going. Yeah, I'm just trying to cut through the noise and concentrate. Anyways, uh, so the main transformer would, uh, uh, would um, um, send the main signal and there will be two secondary windings and half of the signal would go one way, half of the signal would go the other way. So uh, whatever somebody is doing uh, at the front of the house, it affects only the front of the house, they get independent signal. And if somebody is doing the monitor mix, some that's called a monitor mix, uh, whether the, you're using the stage monitors or whether you're using the in-air monitors, if it's a serious concert, you are going to have, um, uh, um, 
a separate mix going on. Uh, so the, the musicians, well, the musicians here, this is the most comfortable for them. Okay. <sighs> yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, here is the magnification of that. You see, uh, I'm just going to just going to quickly go over that. This is this part right here. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, here is the uh, XLR input, and there's a line input for the uh, for the same channel. So you plug this one in, the microphone gets through. As soon as you plug this one in, um, then uh, um, then you're going to disconnect that one. Uh, because it's the way it's physically made, like that, okay? Then uh, there's some line levels. So you get two XLR inputs um, uh, uh, or the three prong, which is the balanced. And then there's a, uh, uh, also a pad here, high, high impedance and low impedance, uh, depending on. If you get a buzz, click on that, all right? And maybe the buzz is going to disappear because usually you get the buzz if you have the impedances mismatched enough, all right? Okay, so um, uh, so these are two channels here. Here's a monitor send uh, and the FX send. So these will be outputs. And you can see here probably on your, uh, I wonder if you can see it on, the, uh, on this uh, Zoom um, uh, transmission here, but definitely you're going to see it when you download this uh, 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 available PDF files. Uh, you can have this thing balanced or unbalanced. So depending on what type of a jack you get, tip and ring jack, uh, it is going to internally connect and send this and use this input as a balanced input. Or if you use a tip ring and sleeve jack, which is a quarter inch jack, you can look at what tip ring and sleeve is from a previous lecture uh, or tip and ring, uh, then it's going to recognize it as balanced signals. So uh, this, um, um, uh, what do you call the inputs? can be used in the quarter inch format. This is a quarter inch because it's a diameter, it's a quarter inch or XLR format, which is that. The same thing, you can have a balanced signal sent this way or balanced signal sent that way. Uh, pretty versatile type of thing. And you know, uh, different equipment has different outputs and sometimes you get this cable, sometimes you get the other cable and you're going to use them accordingly. Now, um, so here's the main monitor, main, uh, main outputs. So you can have left and right here. And the left could be uh, used as the monitor. Is there a monitor output here? Here's a monitor sent. So this one actually has the output uh, right here, monitor and main. Here's the monitor, volume control, and there's the main volume control. So the monitor would control this output and then the main would control this stereo type of uh, output. So uh, in this mixing board, that's, you know, and you have a headphones output, you can send uh, as much as you want from each strip. Um, these are the strips. These are strips. Here's a strip, here's a strip, here's a strip, okay? So from each strip, you can send as much as you want to the headphones, uh, so you can balance yourself out here. So if you want to hear back things. Now, somebody asked uh, uh, last year, uh, what is the tape in and tape out? Okay. Now, um, usually there would be something that's called RCA jacks. RCA, yeah, RCA jacks. I think it's Radio College something. I forgot. Uh, but these are these are this is the type of uh, jack. It's called RCA. This is quarter range. This is XLR. Okay, so. Um, um, the RCA jacks uh, would be in the old days plugged in output into the recording tape recorder. And the output of the tape recorder could be plugged into the input. Right. Now, these days you can plug in your MP3 player into the input here. Or you can send the, uh, the output from the tape uh, output. And now we're not using tape right now, but the terminology has stayed, okay? Um, all right, so here is this uh, first three strips, uh, and this is what we already have gone through. Uh, the main stereo, the main, sorry, the main um, 
section of that, what do we have in this particular mixing board? This is an analog mixing board, by the way. Okay. Um, let's just get rid of the distractions here. So this particular one has a little bit of a main EQ equalizer, so you can um, uh, you can adjust the equalization. Uh, if you have a feedback happening, what is a feedback? If they have a microphone, uh, that the microphone is supposed to receive the voice from the either person's mouth, if it's a singer, or you can have the microphone pointing at the guitar amp. It's a very common practice, uh, especially with the uh, with the kind of a classic type of a rock and roll type of a setup. Uh, very, well, you can plug in the guitar directly into uh, whatever the stage box is, or you can plug in the mic, the guitar into the amplifier, and then you put the microphone towards the, you know, so uh, it, sometimes people prefer it that way because it's a certain type of a sound that comes out of the amplifier and you mic it right? and use a certain type of microphone to do that. Um, so what happens is that uh, if there is enough um, signal uh, from the front of the house speakers or the stage monitors speakers, that the sound as it's being produced, it's also being reproduced by the speakers and that accumulates. So that creates feedback and usually sounds like a big squeal type of a thing because the, the, the signal feeds onto itself and it creates a feedback loop. Uh, so sometimes uh, you can catch the frequency and you can take it out a little bit. You know, you, the, the idea of using an equalizer like this, a graphic equalizer, uh, usually we try to subtract frequencies other than add the power to the frequencies. It just works better that way. Okay. Now there's a little button here uh, that says phantom power. What is a phantom power? A phantom power is um, a power that is going to be sent uh, to the uh, to the input jack, all right? It's a 48 uh, volts DC power that's being sent, that's being applied to the input input jack of the um, of the mixing board. That the purpose of that is that if you have a dynamic microphone, then you don't need the phantom power because dynamic microphone is it has a membrane. You make the mem membrane vibrate by your voice or by whatever the sounds coming, and then dynamically it works and it just sends the signal. But if you have something that's called condenser microphone, now condenser is another name for a capacitor. Now capacitors used to be called condensers. So then later on, the name was changed to capacitors. But uh, when it comes to the sort of a stage terminology or microphone terminology, um, it just, uh, that, that, that word has stayed as a condenser microphone. Well, basically what it is, is it has two metal plates. That's a basic construction of a condenser microphone. It has two metal plates and uh, they're kind of close to each other. And uh, once you um, apply voice or the air vibrations or longitudinal waves, uh, compressions and decompressions, those plates are going to vibrate and they're going to change the distance between each other. And as they just change the distance, they are changing the capacitance of the capacitor or the condenser. And then through the electronic uh, uh, circuitry that is connected to that, you know, some resonant circuits or whatnot, XLR, uh, uh, you know, RCA, um, uh, RC, RLC circuits, uh, then uh, you, that is going to create um, uh, um, electronic signal that represents the voice by changing the capacitance of the capacitor or condenser. Okay. Now, those microphones tend to be really quiet as far as noise, all right? Uh, very sensitive microphones, usually used for speech, uh, for the lecterns and podiums. These are those long, uh, kind of like a tin, uh, like this, gooseneck microphones. Usually they are black, you, you can see them and uh, you can adjust them and uh, you have a little microphone head uh, so you almost don't see them. The only thing is with the condenser microphones, you need to have your mouth about uh, volleyball or basketball size distance from that microphone here, okay? Because if you get too close, all the P's and well, mostly the P's and B's, it are going to make those plates touch uh, and you're going to get that boom to that. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the idea of using condenser microphones. They are really quiet, really sensitive, 
really high quality microphones, but sometimes you don't want them. Uh, you don't want them in some applications. You don't want them. So usually there will be a, you know speech kind of a lecterns, podiums, and uh, studio microphones as well. Yeah. Uh, tragically, hip album. I oh, know I forgot my shirt. I should have been. I should have been wearing the tragically hip shirt. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, that's as far as that. Okay, so phantom, okay, the phantom power. The phantom power powers up the electronic circuitry. And if you plug in the uh, condenser mic into the input, so that condenser mic gets its power from the power that's applied through the internal circuitry of the mixing board and it's applied to the terminals of the uh, of the input jack and the power is being applied to that microphone the microphone that condenser microphone is going to use that power to power itself if you plug in a dynamic microphone even if the phantom power is on it is going to be bypassed by the internal circuitry of the uh, of the dynamic microphone so uh, uh, sometimes if you have condenser microphones and there's no sound coming up uh, coming through them make sure that the phantom power switch is on Right? Because sometimes you want to turn it off if you don't use the condenser microphones. Usually the phantom power sometimes, you know, in some less expensive equipment, it might add a uh, you know, certain type of little tiny bit of a noise. Uh, now, when it comes to big mixing boards, uh, the, big mixing, the big mixing boards are same as the small mixing boards, and they have the uh, the same principles. It's just you have, instead of having one, two, or three channels, you get like, this, this, I think this is a 24 channel board or a 30 channel board. Okay? So that would be, a, you know, this would give you a comfort level, uh, you know, as far as stage. And look, here she has a little tiny mixing board here, and you have more output groups in here. So you can send, you have more control knobs, you have a little bit EQ here, you, and you have the sends. This one here, how much of this signal from this strip you're going to send to this group number one, for example. Uh, and uh, how much of uh, that you're going to send to group number two. Those groups usually are being used for the stage monitors mix. Uh, if you're using just one mixing board uh, to power up the stage gear, uh, so you can do that, or you can use two mixing boards with the split snake. And it, uh, when it comes to analog uh, type of, but well, now, right now there are digital uh, systems as well. Uh, so uh, in a smaller venue, if you just do a one man show as far as sound person, uh, then you could uh, get away with one mixing board. Uh, and then you're just going to have to communicate with the stage people there. Or how much, you know, uh, on my stage monitor, can you give me more? of that guitar or can you give me more of my keyboard I can you know I get too much of my voice coming through so then uh, you would use those and uh, and like you know one monitor mix would be going through one stage monitor the other one be going to another stage monitor and you can distribute them accordingly um, so uh, not everybody hears the same thing but everybody hears what they need to hear Okay, as uh, you know, on the stage, so uh, you know, small mix, uh, small mixing board, I uh, mean, big mixing board is uh, just like the small mixing board, but it's just expanded more. It's big mixing board. Big is same as small, but it's bigger. There you go. It's gonna be on a test. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, now uh, from the analog setup, we're going to move on to something that's called a digital setup here. Now. This is this mixing board looks smaller than this mixing board. This is an analog mixing board that involves everything hardwired. Okay. And everything is at your fingertips because it's a physically built piece of equipment. So everything is plugged into here. Um, and, um, and, and you have at all times you have access to any of those controls. And you have to plug in external effects. Some of them you're going to, some of the mixing boards are going to have internal effects as far as, you know, echo, reverberation, or, you know, some flanges effects or whatnot. But usually they're very limited when it comes to, so if you want to get some additional effects, you're going to patch them through using this section. And accordingly, you're going to patch those effects into whatever the strips need, whatever. So you need, if you if you need to add some effects or or signal additional signal processing, you need to add physical 
uh, equipment. Right? Now, it's bigger. This is smaller, but it's way more powerful than this. Well, this was older, this is newer. Right? This is a uh, uh, very popular uh, Yamaha CL5 digital mixing console. It's, a, it's one of the more popular mixing consoles that uh, the, the professional um, venues use. Uh, CL, I think it's the sense control logic, Yamaha the, the uh, CL5. Now this mixing board, I think it costs something, um, I forgot, but it's anywhere and uh, somewhere, you know, $20,000, $40,000, something like that. Okay, I could be wrong, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's up there. And if you want to buy one of those, you can probably pick it up for, you know, 600 bucks used right now. Okay. It used to be expensive. Now it's when the digital stuff came out. Now, all uh, in the digital uh, world, all these effects are being built in. So you get the graphic equalizers that you can apply to if uh, to um, um, to each individual strip or the main uh, channel. Uh, there will be feedback destroyers, limiters, compressors, and all and whatnot. And these would be called plugins. So you can apply a plugin to one of the strips <clears throat> and uh, you can apply another plugin to another strip so you can apply a plugin um, to the main out all right now over here we go one two three four five six seven eight controls here and another eight controls here so for example you have 16 controls is this a 16 channel board no this is a uh, way more. I'm not sure how you can look at the specs, but uh, it's, it's close to a hundred channels, maybe less. What you do is you use the screen, this screen here, and you shift this physical controls over whatever the channels you are using. Okay? And you don't plug in things directly into this board. You use something that's called a stage box. Right? And we're going to go over that uh, very soon. Right? So over here, you get the 16 channels, or you can get eight channels and can get them display on the screen. And you also have uh, another like computer monitors uh, connected to that. So you can see some of that on, on, on this. Uh, so you can, you can pick a range and then you can adjust those physically. And then you can uh, pick another range and adjust those physically as well. And as you pick those, uh, whatever the settings you had, those are going to automatically set because uh, they have you know, model controls in there. Uh, so they keep the memory, all right. So uh, that's how the you know the main difference between you know digital and uh, and analog, and you have the displays and things like that. So uh, you know it takes a it takes a little bit uh, to learn this particular mixing board, but uh, that you no. Know, also, what you can have with this mixing board is um, uh, you can memorize everything. Okay, so you, if you have a setup, if if you're on the road with uh, with a group, with a bigger group. Uh, you're going to fill up the mixing board pretty good, and you're going to have specific settings for every strip. And if you, when it comes to do a sound check with the analog, you have to do sound check every time and do adjustments manually and on whatnot. Right? Now with this one here, you can uh, you can apply all the plugins, all the settings, and everything as far as the strips go. Uh, so you can have the you can make notes on which instrument goes into which channel here, and you can have the whole setup going on, and you can just memorize the whole setup on a jump drive, right? and you can take it with you. So if you go overseas with your group and you do the sound, uh, you can just take your um, you can take, a, take a jump drive with all the settings, and you can request uh, the impresario agency, uh, whoever is hiring that, you know, organizing the concert, to provide you with one of these, one of those boards. And then you just take the, your jump drive, plug it in, upload the program, and all this, all the settings are there. And if you need to tweak some minor things, because according to the room, then you can. Right? Uh, all right, so that's uh, as far as that. Now, there's also... Um, uh, for smaller venues, uh, you get the links. Uh, you get the physical links or you get the wireless links. So what's happening here? On this stage, it's one of those country festivals or whatever that is. Uh, there's a performing group on the stage and they have all the controls. Uh, I mean, the, all the main equipment, the amplifiers and whatnot, and something that's called a stage box on the stage. 
And over here, what you have is you have just the control panel that communicates with the equipment there and you're just sending control signals to the main stage. So you don't need the physical wires going between the stage and the front of the house. Very convenient thing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, let me just take a quick look at the slides here. Yeah, I don't have that. So, uh, so I'm just going to explain this to you. Oops, shift F5. All right, stage boxes. Here's a, here's a stage. And on the stage, you're going to have a stage box somewhere on the stage. It's, no, it's exaggerating, okay? Um, and over here, you have inputs, 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 inputs. There will be those uh, three prong XLR microphone inputs most of the time. And over here, like let's say if we can have a 16 channel uh, or 24 channel stage box. So you will have 24 um, feeds that feed through the cable into the mixing board. Okay. And this would be a this would be a snake, and it would come, it would have those 24 cables inside, just like the 25 pair cable. It's a little bit you know it's just done a little bit different because it has the shielded uh, stranded uh, pairs. Okay, but uh, it's it's basically you know about this thick uh, you know cable, and sometimes they're 100 feet long, sometimes they're 200 feet long. So this is the analog setup, and also so you get the inputs here and you have some outputs as well because you send the inputs through the snake into the mixing board and from the mixing board you also have output signals so they would come in on that side so let's say this would be the input signals and this would be the returns the input channels and returns so here's input and then you're going to send also but it will be different gender okay so this will be the female jacks and it will be the male jacks and over here, you plug it into the amplifiers and whatnot. So this is uh, this is the analog. Now there's a it, it, this this thing here is called a snake. So on this on this side you have the box, physical box. Uh, looks you know something like this, all right? Like a tablet, but it's about this thick, okay? Or maybe double size of that. And then you have all the inputs here. Okay, so that's on the stage part. On the uh, on the other side, you have the fan out, basically a bunch of wires hanging with uh, with the jacks, and you plug in those into the mixing board, and they are numbered. So there'll be jacks number uh, one, two, three, four, five, you know, one to sixteen, for example, and those also will be numbered. So you just plug into the input, 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 and then there will be reversed gender. Uh, so you will have the returns plugged in, plug into the output of that. And over here, you know, so that's the uh, that's the uh, basic snake, okay? So it's audio snake, and you can have you know sixteen channel audio snake, you have twenty four channel audio snake, and so on. Um, so um, so that now you can also have something that's called a split snake. All right. Is anybody using music for ringtones anymore? There you go, Mr. Andrew. <laughs> He's talking on the phone. It's probably his wife calling. All right. Anyways, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, now there's something that's called split snakes. What's inside here? You have two cables coming out of there. Um, so you would have split snake. Right. Those every input here would have a transformer. So you would have a, uh, you have a transformer right, that we connected to the input side, it's coming in. And this would have two secondary transformers. And one side of the secondary transformer would go to this part. And the other side would go to another cable that could be plugged in to another mixing board that is on the stage, and this would cover the stage mix or the monitor mix. Right? Uh, so now you can see these are isolated. So half of the signal goes here, half of the signal goes here. Right? 
So whatever you adjust here, it doesn't affect the other one. And whatever you adjust here, it doesn't affect that one because these are the outputs. You know? So, uh, but you get half power of the signal, but still okay, still good. So there will be this something that's called a split snakes. Okay, this is the analog world. Now, when it comes to digital world, you still get you still get the stage box. Actually, pretty much all you get is a stage box for the uh, uh, for the digital world. So you have the big digital mixing console right here, okay? It's a digital mixing board. And what you have here you would, on the stage, you will have a stage box. And also you're going to have the same kind of inputs on the stage box. And some returns as well. But in the digital world, what you get, you don't have physical wires going between here and here or multiple wires, you get maybe CAT5E cable that plugs in here with the CAT5E jack or IG45 jack, and it plugs in to the mixing board. And you get one or two, depending on how many channels you're gonna use. So the number of wire or the amount of wire, it's reduced significantly. Right? Um, the only big user difference is, is that uh, the biggest challenge with the analog snakes or stage boxes, when one of the channel goes bad, you're going to hear maybe a ground buzz, like a 60 hertz buzz through it. And sometimes you're gonna have to figure out which one is coming from. So you're not gonna use that channel and you're gonna fix it later. Uh, so the grounding is uh, big, the biggest problem, right? Uh, when it comes to that, it's also a good idea to use the same grounding reference or neutral reference. So electrical panels have the hot, have the neutral, and they have the ground. And the neutral is supposed to be on the same potential as the ground. So here's the problem in the analog world. If you have analog, if this was an analog mixing board, you plug it in to the wall and all the other equipment like amplifiers and so on, you also plug them in to the wall. Now, sometimes there's a big distance between one and the other, and this could be getting a power from one of the electrical panels at the back of this, uh, of this side of the building. These outlets could be getting the power from another electrical panel that is powering up the other part of the building. And quite often what happens is that those grounds or the neutrals, uh, they're on slightly different level. It's just the nature of things. And when that happens, uh, you get this, you get that, and you get the cable, the signal cable plugged in. So you're joining that in creating some sort of like called ground loops and they manifest themselves as a very, very annoying buzz. Okay? So what happens? Um, is um, uh, you use something like uh, maybe a 100 amp uh, or 60 amp, use like a 100 or 200 amp service at the back of the stage and you get professional electrician to um, make it available for you or activate that for you. You plug that in and you get the distro box. Distro box. What it is, is a distro box has a big cable, like a stove outlet or maybe sometimes just the bare terminals with a thick wire and the electrician is going to hold, uh, connect that to you. And you're going to get a bunch of AC outlets coming out of that. And over here, you're going to power up this. And from there, you're going to get a long extension cord and you're going to run it along here and power up this one. So you don't have to use that other panel. So that's called distro box. Uh, you can use, you can you can watch on YouTube, all kinds of things on how to make distros and, uh, and well, it has to be, Basically, those things have to be comply in compliance with the electrical code, and they have to be approved. All right, so that's uh, that's the problem. You need to have the power from this this uh, 
point here or from that point. Usually it's from the backstage because you get the you know, uh, 100M feed provided usually at the backstage. Uh, now, when it comes to digital, um, uh, problems with digital, usually there is no problems. However, if you do, remember we did the terminations of the RG45 jacks uh, in our labs. Um, if you connect, if you terminate this thing not properly, if you lose a connection or if you have an intermittent connection, just think about it. All the sound is being encoded or modulated onto the CAT5E and all that information is being encoded here and decoded on the other side. So if you have a bad connection, you don't get, uh, you don't get uh, annoying buzz or something. You get some kind of a really loud noise that it sounds like the end of the world. It's like a lightning kind of a thunder multiplied by 17 and a half. Right? Oof, right? And it can damage speakers and it can damage people's ears. <laughs> right? So uh, that's the, uh, you know, that's the uh, usual problems that, that or challenges that you deal with that uh, kind of stuff here. Hmm. Now, almost uh, okay. So uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the digital world, and um, you know what? That we are switching more and more, uh, if not all of the professional gear is being already switched to the digital type of a system. And if you want to. Uh, uh, if you want to know more, I would encourage you when the COVID restrictions are being um, lifted, um, I encourage you to see some of my friends at the PA shop there in London. Okay. Go and ask questions. Tell them Walter sent you. Okay. You can use my first name and you go there. <laughs> um, and they have a rental uh, department and all that. Uh, and, you know, who knows? Somebody might, uh, you know, if you're interested and inclined towards that type of field, you, you might kind of, you know, do some job search as well. See if they hire you, right? If they're hiring, right? Because I don't want to, I don't want them to be calling me. Hey, what are you telling people? Go ahead and hire me. Okay, things like that. All right. So now I'm just going to go to some basics of the microphones. All right. Here is the picture of something that's called the SM58. It's made by Shure. SM58, that's what it looks like. And I'm going to, I'm going to be quite bald when I say this. It's a bold statement I'm going to make. This is the best microphone in the world, best dynamic microphone in the world. And I'm not associated with Shure. I just have done sound systems for many years. When it comes to stage gear, this is the best microphone in the world. And there are some people that might diff, you know, have different opinions. Uh, you know, AKG is better. Yes, AKG are excellent microphones. Uh, you know, Sennheiser microphones and uh, you know, whatever, all their microphones by Crown and whatnot. Uh, yes, they're good. All right. But this is the standard. And most of the equipment, not most of the equipment that's being designed is being designed to be tested or take the, they take a reference from this um, SM58 Shure microphone. Right? This is being used for vocals, stage vocals. Right? Can't go wrong with that. If you have a budget and you have a budget to, uh, to just get some of the microphones, get those, you're, you're good. They're wired microphones. Right? And why they are so good? And whatnot. There's so much materials on the internet that you can uh, you, know, you can research that. Now, here is a YouTube link that I posted, and I encourage you to watch that because I'm going to ask some questions on the test when it comes to this. All right. Uh, cup and string, most fun. Peter, elaborate. <laughs> If it's a question, let me know. Uh, I would like to expand on that. Anyways, you have uh, here, you have the YouTube link that I encourage you to watch. I'm not going to play it here, uh, but when you download the presentation, 
click on that and watch the little demo on different microphones applied uh, for the same thing. It's like a, a, B, a and B comparison, but it's like more A, B, C and D comparison. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I would suggest wearing uh, headphones when you're listening to that, when you're watching that YouTube uh, video here. There are going to be some questions associated with that. Then balanced and unbalanced signal, we already talked about that in our previous lectures. Um, so now this is the same, uh, is the same type of a signal uh, system that we have used. Um, all right, we went over that already. So here's a mixing board. This is an analog, typical church setup. Uh, churches are pretty good uh, business to get into. It, get, it gives you a great satisfaction. Uh, because there are certain challenges uh, from our previous lectures, you can tell uh, it's, it's, it's marrying two idea, two concepts, uh, the concept that will require as, as much as possible of, of acoustically dead room or acoustically live room. And they're both environments in one, both concepts that have to be combined in one room. So uh, usually you get a acoustically live room and then you adjust the uh, other concepts to accommodate that when it comes to churches or something that's called uh, houses of worship, okay? Uh, and, uh, and if you get good in it, um, you, can, you can design those, you can install those, and uh, you, can, you can make a career of installing things like that, or you know, it can go as simple as you want, and you can get as complicated as you want, uh, and you can get as busy as you want if you're good in it, okay? Um, where's the, yeah, the microphones here. Yeah. So this is also a YouTube link here. I, I was looking for that slide here. Here it is. So this one here, this uh, YouTube channel or the YouTube video compares SM57, SM58, and SM, uh, sorry, SM7B. The simplest ways, uh, one is uh, for stage vocals, uh, preferably for stage vocals. The other one is for stage instruments. They have slightly little bit different characteristic. And the other one is for studio vocals, most of them. So there are going to be some questions on the test. Uh, you know, so watch, please watch this when you're done. Okay. Um, then uh, this one here uh, compares different brands of microphones, right? Now, I think personally that Shure SM58 is the best microphone in the world since like 1960s, uh, but there are different companies that maybe some of them made it better in certain way and uh, more, uh, more applicable to certain applications. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Then there's a balance and not balance signal. We covered that. Here we covered this. Okay. So we have covered this. Um, uh, PA systems part two. Um, now it's uh, we've gone over a I minute. Mean, no, no, go. We just covered one hour. So let's take. Uh, we need to stretch. Three fifty-five on my uh, telephone here. Let's take seven minutes, eight minutes. Okay, because the, the, this thing is going. So three after four, we're going to meet and we're going to continue with that, all right? I'm going to shut this audio. Oh, I'm gonna pause the video. Yeah. Please remind me to record, turn the recording back when we, when we come back. So, okay, four after four. So 4.04, four. we're gonna come back and continue. Recording again. Okay, so we are back, Buck is back. All right, so uh, we're going to take care of the com uh, computer networks and network topology. Uh, so we're going to take care of the computer networks first. Picture in picture. Oh, there's two of me. Hello, hello. Pretty bunch. All right. Oh, come on. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, all right. So we go computer networks, introduction, introduction to network types definition a computer network is a group of computer systems or other 
computing hardware devices that are linked together through communication channels to facilitate communication and resource sharing among wide area or wide range of users. Networks are commonly categorized based on their characteristics, all right? It's a special type of sticks. They're the characteristics type of sticks. LAN stands for local area network. WEN, wide area network. WLAN, which is wireless local area network. Tank twister. Uh, MAN, metropolitan area network. SAN, storage or system or server or small area network. VPN, quite popular thing these days, virtual private network. And here is a picture of uh, Gateway uh, that uh, I have installed. I think that was, uh, I think it was a liquor store, uh, LCBO in Niagara on the Lake uh, years ago. I just took a picture of that. And over here, what can we see? When we connect uh, that into the equipment rack, we are going to see some lights. When you power it up, there's, those lights are going to go just like disco lights or Christmas lights and start uh, uh, powering up. And uh, first you're going to see the OK um, uh, light. So that means uh, things are OK, well, very technical. Uh, then you're going to see a light that comes on that says when. That means this piece of equipment has found internet, okay? And it's communicating with the internet. So that's the indicator. Then you have the LAN ports. So whatever the LAN ports, these are the RG45 ports at the back of this thing, and they're connected to different type of equipment, uh, types of equipment, uh, usually another switch or routing uh, type of device, whatever it is has to communicate with it <clears throat> and then after a while uh, you're going to just cross your fingers and if this thing is programmed properly you're going to finally see that vpn coming on that means that this thing has found the virtual private network we're going to talk about that uh, so that means if it's a store then uh, we have the uh, we have the when from internet, VPN, that means it is on the network that belongs to this chain of stores or this corporation. That's a virtual private network. All right, local area network. Local area network connects a group of computers in close proximity within the same facility, usually a building or a group of buildings. Purpose, sharing resources and services, such as files, printers, applications, email, or internet accent, accent access. <laughs> uh, and it pretty much looks like this. That's what we're, this part of our assignment that, uh, yeah, that, that, that looks like this. What do we have here? We have the main equipment rack and we have patch panels. Remember patch panels are a bunch of jacks cascaded in a very organized way. So you don't have to have a bunch of wires with the jacks hanging, but they are nicely arranged in a metal strip and physically arranged so you can have all those jacks aligned together. And that's what's called patch panel. Right? Uh, and those are part of the equipment rack. And from there, you use something that's called patch cords is the Actually, the stuff that we made during our last lab, you know, the, we made some patch cords or patch cables. Uh, then those patch cables are patching every single port onto another port, usually a switch or some other piece of equipment, or sometimes directly into the PC. All right, now here's the idea. Here's the wire, the cable that we have run over the uh, uh, our, uh, our assignment and the cable on one end is terminated at the jack, at the other, at the back of the patch panel, you know, A or B configuration. Uh, and the other side is plugged into a single jack, right? And this will be the destination. This will be the home run side. And this will be the destination 
or the field side. And usually, for the most part, we're going to make straight lengths. So if we have T568A on this side, we have to use the configuration A on this side in order to make a straight link. If you use the, if we use the terminate, uh, uh, configuration B, we also have to make a B configuration on the other side in order to complete a straight link. If you have A on one side and B on the other side or vice versa, you're going to make something that's called crossover link. And when it comes to LAN environment, that's pretty much not being used. <clears throat> you usually get straight, uh, you, we're making straight links. Right? And this is called so-called field wiring. They're terminated at the jacks and those are connected to, well, end uh, users or, you know, that could be a desktop. There could be wireless access point. It could be a, um, some other device such as uh, you know, climate control device and some other communicator thing that uses the ethernet type of protocol. Uh, okay, one network can consist of multiple LANs working together. Example. In one, in one facility, you could have accounting department, you can have a production plan, you can have management offices and some other departments associated with that plan. Uh, and you could have uh, sub LANs that connect uh, to each other. So if there's a traffic that the files need to be exchanged between the accounting department and that's to be shared with the virtual private network uh, you're basically going to limit the traffic mess by just concentrating that type of traffic into one kind of an area so you could have one rag that is responsible for one department another rag that's responsible for another department or you could have one huge rag and you could have uh, some some switch or uh, yeah some switch or router or what other things uh, patched through uh, to accommodate this different type of uh, departments. Okay. All right, local area network connects a group of computers in close proximity within the same facility. That's, we went over that. A building, as so I put it in red, a building or group of thereof, a group of buildings. I got this picture from the Google um maps um, right uh, now this is a random picture i just was searching for some sort of something that uh, would present two buildings close to each other this is a tree here by the way right uh, now i don't know what facility that is uh, i don't even know whether they're connected with but let's just pretend that this whole those two buildings are part of one company so you could see the, the company occupies two buildings. So you could have um, local area network set up in one building, and you could have a local area set up, local area network set up in the uh, other building, and they have to work with each other. So how are we going to connect that? Um, <clears throat> we're going to um, talk about something that's called media converters. Right. What is a media? media converter or sometimes it's called media player but usually it's going to be called uh, media uh, converter mm -hmm. what a media converter does let's say you have uh, two LAN racks there's one rack and there's another rack here equipment rack and it has a bunch of equipment here a bunch of equipment here now if you want these two work as one uh, and they're in two different buildings, usually at the top somewhere, you're going to install something that's called a media converter. The media converter is going to convert and multiplex a bunch of signals onto one piece of equipment. And that media converter is going to be connected to that one, and they're going to work. Sometimes they have two links. One goes this way, and the other one goes that way. So what, what is it called media converter? Now, this link here, remember the basic uh, model of uh, telecommunication system? What can we have as a link? 
we could have copper. All right, what else can we have? We could have fiber, or we could have air. Most of those things, right? So this could be copper wires, ethernet, or a coaxial cable as well. Uh, this could be fiber optic uh, link, or this could be air. What's air? It will be antennas. So the purpose of the media converter is to convert all the electronic signals, the LAN protocol, the LAN signal, the Ethernet, uh, into something that could be modulated and transmitted to the other media converter and demodulated and put back here. And those, if you have a link fast enough, the whole computer network is going to basically work as one big computer network one big LAN, local area network, consisting of multiple uh, signals or uh, multiple um, uh, setups or multiple sub LANs. So that's why we use media converters. The other uh, use for media converters would, okay, so this one here will be converting it to either, you know, it could be converting it to uh, fiber optic, so into light signals. And you just use the fiber optic link to connect these two. Uh, you get the idea. Right? <coughs> another um, uh, sort of media converter, uh, there's another uh, uh, terminology that uses media player, which pretty much is basically, it does the same thing, converts one thing to another. Right? And those media players are usually used in something that's called, like, for example, me, uh, menu boards. If you go to any uh, fast food place, usually they are very popular in the fast food joints. Right? Um, behind the, uh, when you're facing the, 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 the cash register or the, 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 the person who's the, the salespeople, uh, behind them, there's gonna be those menu boards. There's called menu boards, uh, a bunch of monitors working together. Sometimes they're cascaded electronically together. So uh, it, like let's say it's like, you know, we shoot a ping pong ball. It's gonna go from one monitor to the other, to the other. It's gonna be like one continuous line. Uh, it all, it's all done through the LAN technology type of thing. Uh, and uh, so what happens is that uh, the monitors, what they have at the back, if it's a monitor, yeah, at the back, it's going to have media converter, but usually those are called media players. So the, uh, the signal uh, from the main server or the main rack, that's it's somewhere in that building, is converted into the... Um, Ethernet protocol and it's being put into that media player and that media player or media converter um, basically uh, its purpose is to provide the signal that the monitor is going to understand. So uh, here's the concept of media converters but in this case when it comes to that uh, those menu boards or things like that uh, usually you're usually going to hear terminology that is uh, media player okay so but, but that's basically that's uh, that's what it is. Now, in the uh, few years back, there, there would be those big monitors and those media players would be a, a, a separate piece of equipment that would be just screwed on to the back and there would be wires connecting it to whatever inputs of the monitor. Right? Later on, um, uh, they have, in, um, uh, they, okay, I use the word they, uh, what was designed was that those uh, those menu boards or those me, uh, those monitors, those big monitors, they would have uh, internal circuitry that would accept a card, okay, um, and that would be have that it would have like an Ethernet jack right here, uh, and that card would be inserted into the card slot that would be uh, designed for that. Now these days, uh, those are integrated, okay. So you have the menu boards produced for certain type of uh, you know, uh, place those monitors would come with the ethernet jack that uh, the whole thing is integral part of this uh, of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, <clears throat> when you go to uh, Tim Hortons or Burger King or McDonald's or something else, you're going to see a uh, bunch of uh, articles being displayed on those menu boards. And one of them is going to show something like a cute puppy dog or something, and it's going to be a still image. So what that means that there's no communication between that monitor 
and the rest of the equipment. And usually it's a bad link. And usually, that's why I put a great stress on making those jacks properly, uh, prop, uh, no, properly uh, the Ethernet uh, patch codes that we made. Because sometimes you're going to run a wire from one end that goes to the equipment rack, and the other end is going to be plugged in right into the back of that uh, so-called TV or the monitor. Uh, if, if it's not crimped properly, if it's not aligned properly, it might work for two weeks, two months, six months. And then finally, something's going to happen that the connection is going to go bad on you. So this, in, this is going to be interrupted. So that means there's no communication between that. And the default picture is being uh, displayed on, on that. Uh, if you get job, if you get yourself a job in this type of uh, uh, telecommunications uh, world, you are going to have a lot of service calls like that. Okay. Basically, what it is, you just go in there and check the uh, unplug it. Watch it, unplug it from the other side, watch it. You know, whichever is closer is easier. Uh, and then you can uh, use the tester, plug in the dummy uh, to one end, go with the tester, plug it in, push the test button, see, and sometimes it's gonna show you that the wire is broken uh, or something like that. So then you just get uh, one of those jacks that, that we what you used during the lab. Uh, you uh, just uh, you know, strip the cable, trim it, put it on, crimp it, plug it in and uh, you're going to call in whoever the third company would be to log into the system from outside, wherever it is and verify the connection. And then you're going to see instead of a cute puppy dog, you're going to see the proper content being displayed on that, uh, on that monitor. Okay. So that's, uh, that's when it comes to media converters and media players. So uh, there's a technique of erasing this board here. Mm -hmm. well, during the labs, I'm showing you the most common activities that you might be involved um, while, um, while working in this type of telecommunication field. There's a lot. All right. So we go back to this picture here. Uh, here's a network system there with the equipment rack, and there's another network, or maybe two or three here with the, it, with their own uh, rack. <coughs> Excuse me. The one of the buildings could be could be having the MDF. MDF stands for main distribution frame, right? and along the other buildings there could be uh, IDFs which is intermediate distribution frame. There's only one main distribution frame because there could be only one main one. And the IDFs are distributed around the building. Why? From past lectures to accommodate the distance of 300 feet. So the link, the ethernet link is going to be no longer end to end than 300 feet. Actually it's 328 feet, but we're just using the 300 feet number all the time. All right, uh, so let's just consider these two buildings. They have to work as one. So we're going to have a link. The link could be Ethernet or fiber link. Usually it will be a fiber optic link. And this will be connected to a media converter on the closest rack wherever it's connected. And the other end is going to be also connected to a media converter on the other side. So it could be hardwired link, it could be copper or, um, or fiber. Or there could be a wireless link. And also there will be a media converter on this side and a media converter on this side. It's just, it would be a different type of media converter because if you have a fiber optic link then the that you will need the kind of media converter that would connect the ethernet protocol into the fiber optic signal so it'll be light pulses right so you could connect the fiber optic link if you have the wireless link then you also get a media converter but it would be a different media converter because uh, you would have to convert the ethernet protocol in to something that is transmittable and receivable by, by the antennas okay so uh, Here's the concept of the media converters. Okay. Now, LAN cable structure example. Um, what did I say here? 
Not all networks are up to the highest standards. Some service calls will look like this. What do we have here? Well, we have one shelf that is fastened to a plywood wall, and it will be some small sweatshops, uh, you know, whatever it is. And every, every, you know, see, here's the thing. Every little business needs a network these days. So there's a lot of work that if you can be as busy as you want, if you go into this type of field. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what do we have here? We have a uh, switch here. And instead of patch panel, we have uh, multi-port uh, surface mount enclosures. One, two, three, four jacks on here and four jacks on here. So the field wiring is connected to the back of this of these jacks and they're just being put into the enclosure here. So this serves as a patch panel. And from here you get patch cables or patch cords plugged in to a switch. So it's like a one-to-one. -one. This port, this port of that link that goes to uh, the other side goes to the destination in the field. It's plugged into one of the ports on the switch. And the other one is plugged into another port of the switch and so on. And over here, you have some signal routing equipment. So it could be a router and there's could be a gateway. It could be all kinds of things that the switch connects to. So this would be some small, you know, tire changing shop or, or, or you know, mechanic shops or something like that. And you're going to have something like that. Um, you know, as long as you can see the same elements, you just go and service that. You know, and uh, you know, what's the uh, you know, what's the objective of the game when you do or you know in service this type of service? You go and do the job. You 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 find the problem, you re you repair whatever you needs to be repaired, and uh, you write them an invoice and you cash the money. Right. So that's the idea. All right. So some service calls will look like this, and this is like one of those cleaner ones from the sweatshops. Some sometimes this thing is going to be covered with dust or you know some residue of grease or something like that. So with time, if it's too much dust, too much grease, those things are going to fail. So that's uh, that's where we that's where we, you know we make money. Okay. Uh, now uh, some of the uh, some of the lands are going to look like this. Now this is. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think it's a data center, Google data center that is available on the internet. Uh, you're going to have the reference um, uh, picture, or the reference to this picture on the uh, PDF uh, lecture notes. Right? Now, just a little kind of a thing here. Consider the power requirement because, you know, you're going to say consider the power required to service all the equipment and they consider the power required to cool down the whole environment. Two vertical section racks produce, well, on the average, the heat equivalent to a house barbecue running full blast. So how many barbecues full blast do we have in this room? One, two, three, I don't know, a lot, right? So <clears throat> if you have that many barbecues running or the heat that is produced equivalent to the barbecue running, full blast, just imagine how much heat this whole thing produces. And this is a very loud environment. You need earmuffs to enter that room because you're going to get a you know, hearing damage if you don't, right? <clears throat> because from all the cooling fans on the equipment. So in order to, to use the, uh, for this thing to operate at all, you need, oh yeah, I can see the power uh, distribution uh, boxes here. Uh, you need the power to power <clears throat> all this equipment and takes a lot of power, but you also need a lot of power for the air conditioning for this. And if you see the, our college, um, is the E building or something like that. Uh, that's where our main frame or one of the frames is. And you're going to see a lot of uh, plumbing structures, plumbing like structures. That's the big air conditioning that is supposed to um, um, cool the room down, okay? Now, yeah, bounce, 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 power, so that's what I said, that's what I said. Now, consider the structured cabling on this thing here. What do we see? We see a lot of equipment racks and all of them are getting their wires in there from the front between it so they can uh, have the wire management, um, um, equipment here, 
but also there's a lot of wires going through the back, but we don't see the wires. Look, there's a cable tray and it's almost empty. You see some of those flex pipes, those orange flex pipes that they're, uh, you know, they look like a vacuum cleaner hose, uh, like a perforated type of a pipe to, uh, to protect that from physical damage. And usually when you see that, that there's a fiber optic lines going inside those. Yeah? Uh, now, <clears throat> where's all the wiring? Right. Ah, cables under the floor, Sean, there we go. How is it that the cables are running on the floor? Look at the floor in this room. It's called a raised floor. Here's the concept of a raised floor. Just like the ceiling structure for the ceiling tiles, you also have a grid on the floor. And you know, sometimes a foot or two feet of the ground, about foot, foot and a half. And there are those floor tiles. Now they're expensive, they're heavy, but all the wire goes inside the floor. Very, very convenient solution, but also very expensive. How do we get those tiles out? We get those suction cups. So when there's a raised floor, you're going to ask the facilitator or whoever walks you into that room, if you got a service call, to find those suction, suction cups. So you can just basically uh, use the suction action there and lift those tiles because they're heavy and you, can't, you just can't lift them up with your fingernails or a you know, screwdriver or something. It's just not happening. Uh, so you need, those, uh, you, know, you need those suction cups. So here's the idea of a raised floor. See how much you're learning? Now we're jumping on to the WEN, which stands for Wide Area Network. Right? WEN joins an unlimited number of smaller networks right? in a way that the devices of different networks can communicate with each other. Example, any example of that? Anybody can think of what I'm talking about here? This program is brought to you by the World Wide Web Internet, okay? So that's uh, when. So remember when we had that uh, light that, uh, that was on the equipment on the first picture that said when? So the more light that light comes on, that means that equipment found the internet. All right, now here is an example of a uh, well, household device. <clears throat> uh, could be a router, modem in one piece and a switch. All right. um, what do we have here? We have ports. Now this one here says LAN one, LAN two, LAN three, LAN four. This is where you would plug in your devices, a computer, wireless access point, or whatever else. Now this is a double function port here. We're gonna take care of we're gonna take care of that. Also, it has something that's called DSL, and this one has something that so these are these these have the RJ45 ports. RJ stands for registered jack, and these are the Ethernet, the computer jacks, eight prongs. This one here looks like it's RJ12. RJ11, RJ12, they're very, well, they're same in size, but RJ11 has, it accommodates three pairs and RJ12 accommodates four pairs. Now, RJ11 accommodates two pairs, RJ12 accommodates three pairs. Sorry, my bad. So, this is just kind of like a phone plug, phone plug. And DSL stands for Digital Subscribers Line, which is the internet brought to you by the telephone cable. Right? So you can plug this in and this would connect to your WEN, World Wide Web, Wide Area Network. Now, this piece of equipment here has another function here that you can use the port number one as when. How would you want to use that? Well, if you connect the DSL to this, then this box also acts like a modem. Modem stands for modulating and demodulating. Modem. Modulate, demodulate. Modem. 
So then it's going to act also as a modem and it's going to translate the signal, analog internet signal into a digital ethernet signal. And those can be grabbed from this LAN ports that connect to your computers. If you don't have DSL, you can have a separate modem, which has a ethernet out, then you would use the first port in this particular equipment to connect to the modem because you could have a cable modem or you could have fiber optic uh, feed going in there. So you don't have a DSL, so you're just gonna use that. And then you have three ports that you could plug in. They could plug in a switch or a hub into each one. So you could put like an eight port switch into one of them. So that switch, that LAN port is going to be able to connect eight computers. And I just have a reset button and power button, right? So that's uh, uh, that's the idea of the when kind of a thing here, all right? WLAN, wireless local area network. As the world wireless suggests, uh, this type of LAN uses a wireless network protocols to establish communication between the devices. Is it possible to have a complete, almost 100% wireless network most residential systems, yes. Um, for most residential systems, you would have the internet box, as they call it, and this, this could act as a modem, switch, router in one, um, and it has the wireless ears or the antenna, and you use your laptop or other devices, cell phones, uh, to link into that uh, through the wireless. So that's the Wi-Fi kind of a thing. You know? uh, <clears throat> now, even the wireless devices require wiring to be powered. So wireless thing still needs wires. It's one of those paradoxes here. Or when can be a part of LAN where some devices are connected with copper or fiber optic links and some devices communicate with the network through WAPs, which is wireless access points. Right, so just take an example, of, uh, you know, take a look at our college. If you walk into our lab room, you're going to see the wireless access point hanging from a threaded rod from the ceiling. So that white box with the light on, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's blue, and some very rarely it's going to flash, right? So this, uh, I think we have the Cisco ones uh, in, our, in our school. Uh, this particular one uh, has a light. If you have the green light, that means nothing is linked to it. Right? As soon as you walk in, you use your cell phones to connect into the school network. That thing is going to link into that. So as soon as one device links into that, the light turns blue. That means something is using it. And if it's flashing, that means it's the, you know this could be an error in an error mode. It's, you know, the box is broken. Somebody fix it. Uh, or, um, or it could be booting up or things like that. So something is wrong when it's uh, flashing, right? So uh, look at some of those... Uh, uh, no, a lot of those wireless access points are all around the school. Some of them are hanging from the ceiling and some of them are mounted on the walls. Okay. And take a look at some of those lights. Now, uh, COVID times, uh, quite often the school is you know, pretty much almost empty. Uh, so you, you might actually, uh, by chance, walk onto one of them that you're going to see green light on it. And you stand beside it for a while. This thing is going to find your phone. And the light is going to turn blue. So the, 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 what my point is here is that the lens, um, not always they're going to be just one type. There could be a wired uh, links from the equipment room uh, into the you know, um, desktop locations. And that's where the printers and computers and everything else is plugged in using wireless connections. And that equipment rack also is going to have a link connecting uh, the wireless access point somewhere. Uh, all the fast food restaurants and whatnot, they also have the consumer um, side Wi-Fi, you know, so that's the wireless access point. Okay? Uh, so usually the networks are a combination of different ways of communicating with devices. So they could be hardwired and they could be wireless. That's what usually you're going to see. Right? And this is what the wireless access point looks like. This one is by Cisco. Can you spot the WAPs mounted around the hallways uh, of our school presently? Ah, it's 2020. It should be 2021 right now. 
uh, the wireless access point at Fancha have status lights and I just explained them to you. Okay. Examples, other examples of using the WAPs would be um, conference rooms. You get guests coming in from different companies and you have conference people coming with their own devices, their own tablets, laptops, cell phones and whatnot. So they could use the wireless access point in this room or they could use the whatever the consoles are provided here. So conference rooms are very, uh, very popular when it comes to that. But pretty much everywhere, there's a network, uh, you know, including the fast food places, fast food restaurants, right? Metropolitan area network. It's like a land, but bigger. Right? <clears throat> network spanning a physical area. So it's the definition of spanning. So, you know, something such as railroad trussle or bridge that extends from one point to another. So a network spanning a physical area, a network covering, extending over the like umbrella cover over that uh, over the whole bigger area. Okay? Larger than land, but smaller than when. Of course, it's a metropolitan. It's owned by a city usually, okay? such as a city. Okay? Uh, a man is typically owned by owned and operated by a single entity, such as a government body or a large corporation, such as a city. Right? So the traffic lights, for example, in the um, uh, in the city on the roads, quite often you're going to see uh, like a rectangular device. That's the antenna. That's the wireless antenna that communicates with another antenna somewhere else um, that is controlling the maybe the traffic lights or the street camera or the traffic camera or you know the red light camera things like that there are a bunch of devices although so you're going to see those rectangular devices that look like a white kind of a tablet but it has no screen that's the antenna that communicates that signal and sends the control so uh, quite often you have no wires anymore and sometimes they're fiber optics sometimes they're copper Right. So uh, the traffic lights would be part of the MEN metropolitan area network. The city cameras would be part of the MEN. The Wi-Fi in some sort of a corporate park would be part of the MEN. Things like that, right? References, references. Okay, all right. SAN system area network. Links high performance computers, all right, with high speed connections in a cluster configuration. What are we talking about here? Such as a cluster area network, woo, all right, C A N, CAN, all right. Uh, so let's say, uh, the, you know, the system area network, there could be a system in Paris, there could be a system in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, and uh, those systems could be connected through, you know, well, through a VPN, right? But they will be considered as a one system area network. Usually that's used for storage and that's part of the dark side of the internet. Dark side of the internet is the side that is not available. Those connections are not available to the regular bread eaters like you and I, um, but, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, but uh, there's a lot of communication going on between corporations, uh, you know, different corporations, you know, maybe uh, hospitals, police stations and whatnot. They use uh, something that's called storage area network or system area network. Um, the S stands for different, uh, you know, different words. So system area network, storage area network. Uh, now, um, you see in blue, I put something that's called the storage area network. Something that you are using without knowing it, you're using a storage area network quite often, right? Anybody has Netflix? Anybody uses video on demand? Well, let's see, all right? Direct accessibility to servers. That's the characteristic of the storage area network. Indirect or conditional accessibility to end clients. So if you're using the video on demand from your local TV provider, uh, you are going to have some access, but it's going to be limited uh, and they're going to have the consumer rights to that. Uh, end client might access the same data subject to conditions. 
You know, if there's an accounting department, so some senior officer from the accounting department somewhere there, uh, they could have more rights to access the personal data files of people who are working for the company using the storage area networks. Also, it's a very popular in um, large corporations such as school boards, for example. Um, the storage area networks. Let's say there's one main building that serves as the board of education. That's the main building where all the logistics or the, the you know, people in management are, <clears throat> and they will have a main computer frame or the network frame there with all the storage data that has all the personal files of the employees and everything else that has to do with the corporation. But let's say that building catches on fire. So all the data is going to be lost. Paychecks are not going to be written. No, because parallel to that system, in some schools, they're going to be put on the, the another storage servers, which are going to copy. Always, they're going to copy the content of the main server. So if something happens to that one, you can still retrieve the data somewhere else. And something happens here, you know, so it's like a uh, double security or triple or quadruple security. So, uh, you know, you, you can't just destroy one building hoping that uh, that you're going to destroy the data. <laughs> I mean, uh, if something happens, then the data is still available. So that's why, uh, you know, this uh, uh, the storage area networks are popular. Okay. Now, uh, storage area networks example, Local television service provider. And then somebody put my pictures there without my picture there without paying the royalties. Well, that's okay. You know, I'll let that go. All right. So this is a local area uh, that's called War Talk. <laughs> that's called War Talk. Hey, you know, have you seen the movie? It's called War Games about the guy using the modem with the phone, uh, you know, with his girlfriend from high school, da, 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 doing the uh, logging into some Pentagon or something like that. It's an old movie. I think it was in 1984 or 1983. I remember when that movie came out. <laughs> and I went to see that movie when this thing came out. Right? Pretty interesting movie. Now it's kind of funny because <laughs> it shows that the computer couldn't handle the data and the... It was calculating so hard that the monitor blew up. And we were just looking, oh, is that what happened to the computers? At that time, we didn't have that. You know, so, right? uh, so it was an artistic representation of uh, computer uh, overloading. Yes. Yeah, it's a good film. Yes. Uh, nice. You know, one well, of the Sunday afternoons things. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. So let's analyze the signal path of the storage device or storage uh, system, that the one that we're using. Imagine there is a uh, happy family gathered around the television set, right? In 60s or 70s, people would call them television set. Now we call them TV. <laughs> and those would be a part of the big furniture. So I just kind of use my sense of humor to put that on, all right? So here's a happy family and they're happy and dressed up. You know, this guy has a suit and tie, all right? And this guy is eating an apple. Oh, that's a happy family, all right? Okay, so <clears throat> that television set is connected to something that's TV box. We're jumping in time, all right? TV box, well, you know what? I put in brackets, a media converter, all right? that connects whatever the signal is coming from the outside to the signal that's understandable by the television set. Right. So the signal is bidirectional. That bidirectionally connects to a modem that modulates the Ethernet protocol from this one here into something that is called a cloud, which is the internet. Right. So that's one side of that. Right. Let's see the other side. Here's the cloud again, but we're going to continue on the other side. This cloud gives the signal bidirectionally, of course, to the signal routing system at the local TV service provider. That goes into something that's called a media retrieval rack. And it's a rack that has a bunch of storage devices in there, and they mostly would be the um, hard drives, okay? So there's a lot of hard drives there. See this here, this rack here, it is full of hard drives. 
and there's a magnified view of that. This is actually a picture I took. So I don't have to provide the reference to this because these are my photos. I took that picture when I was getting a personal grant tour at one of the service providers. And this would be hard drives here. This rack, like for example, this rack contains 230 hard drives. Each storage drive has 1.8 terabytes full of movies, shows, and otherwise audiovisual content. So you can just multiply the terabytes by 230 and you're going to get the number. So there's a lot of storage there. And these are SCSI drives. I can Google what SCSI is. All right, so uh, then we're going to jump into something that's called a virtual private network VPN, All right? It's a secure virtually created within the internet, a tunnel between two or more devices. Confused yet? Still? Well, oh, just stick with me and I'm going to clear all your confusions here in about a few seconds, a few minutes, a couple minutes. VPNs are used to protect private web traffic from snooping, interference, censorship, or basically it's like a, you know, it's a secure pipe, but it's not a pipe, but you can imagine that it is, right? It's within the internet. Large corporations use VPN technology to link facilitated or facilities located in different geographical locations. So what's a VPN, a virtual private network? In order for us to have a private connection, if there's a company that is in London, Ontario, and that company has a, it's like a chain, let's say it's a, it's a chain, corporate chain. Main office is in London. There could be a subdivision somewhere in Toronto. There could be another subdivision uh, or sub you know, building or facility that is located in Montreal. There could be another one that's located somewhere in China. There could be another one that's located somewhere in India and so on. And they are supposed to work as one. So then again, it's the whole objective of this whole point is to make everything work like a LAN, like a local AI network. So it would be a, through the VPN, you can make it look or behave like a LAN, local air network. How is that happening? Well, in order for that to, uh, to, to work with, if, if you just want to have private wires, you're going, to, you're going to have to extend wires from London to Toronto, and you, go, you, know, you need maybe 50 wires or 100 wires or 2,000 wires to get the proper throughput through that. And then you're going to have another 500 wires going from here underground uh, you know, to Montreal. And then you're going to have another 3,000 wires or 200 wires going uh, to China. And that's not happening. What happens is that a chunk of the internet is being designated as a private link. Right? How, does, how is that being done? Encryption, through encryption. So uh, only the companies or the facilities that are signed up to that VPN can use that VPN. So it's just like a link connected, but it's not physical. Well, it is physical because using physical wires, servers or whatnot, but it's considered as the cloud, as the big WAN, internet type of thing, World Wide Web. And it's a private sort of a connection. Why it's called V? Virtual? No, oh, because it's virtual. It's a, you know, it's, it's not a physical dedicated wires. It's a part of the internet, chunk of the internet designated for that. And only those companies who have the encryption to do that, to use that, it's next to impossible to break into that. Okay. So what are the benefits of that or the uses? Uh, examples, for example, uh, ExpressVPN. There could be, uh, you know, shopping using online shopping. That's being used. That's uh, the encryption of uh, VPN is being used. Uh, so all the, you know, for example, a bank could have a bunch of uh, money machines all around, and those would be connected to VPN. 
um, stores, um, let's say a large department store chain uh, would be having different store locations in different parts of the world. Um, and all the accounting, all the transactions and all whatever else, the management files, they have to be shared as one corporation. So all those locations are tapping onto the VPN. Right? And they, through that, they're going to work almost like one land, one big land, characteristics of the land, but it's not land because it's a different part of the world. So that's the purpose of the VPN. Um, well, yeah, so here is uh, the visual of that. It's almost like a secure pipe or tunnel connecting one facility to another that belong to the same corporation or the same company. Right? Another visual of that, here's a map of the world. And there are locations of the same company. Right? If you connect that to VPN, oop, come on. If all of them are connected to the same VPN, they all work as one. Right? So, Remember when we were using the VoIP assignment, our assignment? Here's the best example. This company could have the VoIP system. This company could have the same VoIP system, telephone system, and so on. And the hosting company could be somewhere in Europe, for example. Right? And all of them are interconnected with the VPN. So before, if the person in Africa wanted to call somebody in Canada, they would have to select a line, the pot line, dial a long distance and ring in to that company and being patched through. And then it would have, you know, but it would be a long distance telephone call. And if it's a big company, there would be a lot of communication going on between you know, the people who work there. Uh, the bills would run up. But if you have the long distance bills would run up. And that's what it was done for a long time until the VPN came into play, came in play. So um, uh, now when they're connected through VPN, there is no difference between this person in Africa calling his friend who sits the next cubicle beside him or calling that person in Canada or in South America, because this would be all interconnected through VPN. So that would be the idea of VoIP. That's why a lot of companies, especially the big chain corporations, they switch to VoIP, voice over internet protocol for the telephone systems. All right, can we exist without internet? Ah, you, can, you can watch that cartoon here. Internet is down, click on that and see what happens. Okay, and uh, there's a couple of uh, how to terminate RG48. Uh, you know, we've done that uh, just for your own reference. Um, you can click on that or not later on, All right? References and so on. Now, I'm going to continue with this. Uh, if you need to go, just go. If you, uh, if you can stay, just stay. I'm trying to give you as much information and knowledge as possible, so you're getting a good bargain for your buck here, right? All right, I'm going to log into or load um, topology. Okay. Oh, so here's network topology or topology. I'm going to try to go quickly through that. So we know what networks are and types of networks. Now the network topology, it's the arrangement or physical connections within the network. And there are different type of connections, types of connections, uh, ring, mesh, star, fully connected, tree, inline or chain or bus. We are going to concentrate on this, on these four here. Ring, star, hey, ring goes star. Ring, star, inline, and a bus. All right, so definite, Definitions, definitions, <laughs> network topology, <clears throat> network topology, 
the arrangement of a network, including its nodes and connecting lines. That's it. <laughs> it's the arrangement of a network, including its nodes and connecting lines. There you go. I wrote it. I should be able to read that. Two ways of defining the network geometry, right? physical topology and a logical or signal topology. And after this show, you're going to know what this means. All right. Basic elements of a network presentation. Hosts. On the left side, we have hosts. And we have applause. All right. On the right side, we have uh, connecting links. Ding, 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 ding. You know, games are just about to begin. All right. Hosts will be computers or nodes. Same thing. Computers. Wireless access points, routers, switches, hubs, bridges, gateways, and three dots. <laughs> Printers and other devices such as IP cameras, internet protocol cameras. On the links, what do we have? Copper? What else? Yes, you guessed it. Fiber or air? So we have all the players now. Let the games begin. Ring topology. That's the symbol of the ring topology. Each node or host connects to two adjacent nodes in a continuous pathway for signals through each node. So here's a device, here's a device, here's a device, and they're connected in a, a ring topology, the ring type of arrangement. Data travels from node to node with each node along the way, handling every data packet. Every node acts as a repeater. So you imagine you are a device in a ring and you have a name. And uh, so one of the computers tries to reach the computer, three computers further down the road, but it's only connected to you. And so here's a message for so-and-so message is so and so and so you it's not for you so you're going to repeat that message pass it along here's a message for so and so you know, meet me at four o'clock uh, i'm not that person and so on so every, every node acts as a repeater until it gets to the proper one and say oh got the message and my answer you know it goes the same way right or it goes in the ring right? there's a difference between ring and a token ring we're going to talk about that ring topology hardware single port mic all right, and here we have the two port or double port NIC. What's a NIC? NIC is network interface card. This is the big one. These are the big ones for the you know, desktop PCs, but uh, the laptops and whatnot, they do have those built in and they're much smaller. Which NIC should be used in a ring network? Single port or double port? Well. I think we should know the answer to that. Of course, we're going to have to connect something in here and connect something to there. So in order to do that, to work that in a ring topology, physical topology, is it possible to have this only the single port and the equipment still work as a ring? Yes, it's possible, but it's not physically possible. It's well, mentally possible. It's um, logically in a logic way possible right but physically you need double port mix right? this is how the data travels in a ring configuration right? ring <laughs> wow token ring data travels only one way in token ring data travels both ways Oh, wow. There's something wrong with the display here. Uh, applications, uh, when or men. Let's see here. All right. Here's a man network. 
And these buildings are connected in a ring topology and they're using different connecting links. So these two buildings are connected through fiber, this can, can also to fiber. And But these here are using, oh, you know, they apply different media converters, but the communication happens in a ring or a token ring. Most of the time, this would be connected in a token ring because for example, <clears throat> if one of the link is, what? Okay, so I've got a commercial happening here. If one of the link, oh, error. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, if this link is broken, then if it only goes one way, then, uh, well, the communication will be suffering, right? But if it's a token ring, if this building is trying to send information to this building and this link is broken, it's gonna try to send it the other way. So it's, you know, it's gonna get it one way or the other, right? Uh, so that's the advantage of having a token ring type of a uh, configuration of a ring. Right? So the physical is ring, but the token ring is uh, uh, how the signal travels. Uh, you can travel in both directions. Right? So this one is in a token ring. Applications, right, LAN. Switches can be talk, can be connected in a ring configuration. So sometimes you're going to have one switch with a bunch of ports. Let's say this one is a 24 port switch. It has 24 Ethernet ports in there. Now uh, the building has more than 25 uh, nodes or equipment or computers or whatnot. So you need to add another switch. But these switches need to be connected to each other. So you basically connect them in a ring configuration here. So if you connect them like that, they're high speed connections and they're short patch cables. Those switches, and when they're connected like that, they act like one big switch because they're cascaded in a ring configuration. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. Watch these YouTube links. One is seven minutes and the other one is, uh, well, only one minute and 42 seconds because then this guy talks about how to set up a specific type of equipment. We don't need to know that for this course, but you get the idea of how things are being set up. But I want you to know the difference between a hub, switch, and a router. Because I, I'm going to ask you some questions about that. And then here's, you're going to see how things are set up in the you know, kind of real physical world. I'm not going to play those here. Star topology, ah, as opposed to ring, it looks like a star. There's one main nod, that will be like a patch panel or something, or maybe one switch and their devices branching off. This is the mouse. Okay, each node or host, host of a network is attached to a central node. So this would be a central node and this would be the nodes, nodes that are connecting to it. The central node is usually a hub or a switch. The central node can also be another proprietary device such as NVR, for example, network video recorder, in a video surveillance system. So if you have security cameras, that's NVR, network video recorder, or DVR, digital video recorder, they are mostly the same thing. They, uh, uh, they will be acting as a central node, okay? Uh, <clears throat> star topology is the most common physical wiring configuration considering horizontal network wiring. I will talk about what horizontal network wiring is. Star topology concept diagram. Well, here's a switch and well, computers are connected to it. There you go, well, now you know that. Um, star topology, that's what it looks like uh, in the real world. All cables home run to one common point and it will be terminated in the patch panel. So these were the patch panels. See how many wires there are? All, every single wire, every single of these wires connects to some single jack somewhere in the building. And the other end is terminated at the back of a patch panel. Yeah. And on the other side, on the front side, uh, this is the other side of the patch panel. Here's the patch panels. And there's a switch here. So the patch, panels are being connected. Every port has one physical port that's connected into the switch. Because you know, if you have a wire or cable 
connected to a field destination or a destination spot where they plug in the computer, the other end has to be plugged into something, right? So that's how things are being done. We're not physically wiring them in to the RG45 plugs and plugging them in, although some of the smaller networks, um, <coughs> cheaper, whatever solutions, um, sometimes you're gonna see that as well. You're gonna not use the patch because if you have like three, four computers, you're not gonna bother with a patch panel. Uh, if it's like at your home in your basement or whatever, but uh, in a larger setting, it's it will be impossible uh, because you know you have like six hundred uh, connections. You're not going to have wires dangling and trying to you know you just wouldn't be able to do that. All right, so uh, so that's how things are done. So it's star topology because everything home runs to one central location. Yeah. Horizontal. <laughs> What does it mean horizontal? Okay, well, horizontal wiring would be all the computers or network devices connected to one switch or one equipment rack. And it could be visualized very easy because it's like one floor. There would be a riser here. A riser is a pathway between the closets. And quite often you're going to see in large corporations, large buildings, you're going to see the LAN rooms on top of each other. They're connected with a big pipe so you can run the wires between them. So it's happening in hospitals, business buildings, uh, you know, the business high rises in uh, you know, like Toronto or in London, downtown, things like that. So you're going to notice that those LAN rooms or the communications closets are going to be one on top of each other as far as the floor arrangement goes. So this will be called a riser, right? And this here, when the computers or the wires are branching out from one communication closet, it is the part of the horizontal wiring. Now, just uh, hypothetically, if one of the computers was here and there would be wire running this way and somebody made a hole in the floor and connected that, this would be part of the horizontal wiring for this, right? So I just want you to know the concept of this. So here's the horizontal wiring, things are patching into one communication closet and here's the riser idea. And also this uh, here is considered as a backbone. Right? What could be a backbone? You know that uh, uh, well, the internet box that you get at home that's being shipped to you from wherever online, everybody's buying online right now. This also would be considered the backbone right? because from there, everything branches off to uh, Computers, wireless access point, so that would be the backbone. But the backbone here is uh, you know, more clearly visible in uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, commercial use. Now, can we point the MDF and IDFs here? Yes, of course. This would be the main cross connect with the main communications room. This would be the MDF, main distribution frame. And those would be the IDFs intermediate distribution frames. Oh, there you go, intermediate cross connects, main cross connect. Right. Sometimes they're gonna be called cross connects, but quite often they're going to be distribution frames. So IDF, MDF. Now, structured network cabling. Most popular physical cabling topology is the star topology. All right, that's another you know, same picture that we just went over. That's how a star topology looks like. And if you're connecting or wiring a network in the building, yes, you're going to use the star topology, which means you're going to home run everything to one single location. Star topology. Bus topology. In the good old days, which would be like 90s, or maybe 80s as well. Uh, the computer networks used a bus topology. And what would be used for that? It'd be coaxial cable with the top-offs, right? So this, um, this T connector will be connected to a coaxial cable and that will be connected to the next T and then going there. And over here, you will have the top-off that you will be able to connect the computer into that. No, that's not being used anymore. But I just want you to know that something like that did exist. Now, does it mean that the bus topology is abandoned all the way uh, together? No, 
the bus topology is still being used. Now, there will be a different protocol, signal protocol, when using coaxial cable because well, uh, different type of multiplexing will have to be used. But it was it, it worked, okay? Not as fast as this uh, Ethernet um, systems right now, but it did work. I remember in our college, there was one like that in 1990. Right? <laughs> um, all right, so in bus, there's one main signal. Remember when we talked about the distributed audio system? Here, the main audio line is acting like a bus. And all those speakers are tapping in, the speaker stations are tapping in. It's like a bunch of parallel connections, tapping in, getting as much signal as they want. So that would be the simplest bus topology. Now, when it comes to bus topology, the closest way to a bus topology would be also, imagine, a, um, red, imagine the radio station. Right? The air acts as a common bus, except it's not in the form of a wire, it's in the form of the, you know, kind of a cloud space. So there's an antenna transmitting a radio signal and everybody who's driving their cars are tapping into that, uh, well, tapping in. Uh, the air kind of surrounds everything and the space around, so the waves, are, you know, uh, the radio waves are hitting that and the receiver is tapping into that one common. So it's sort of like a bus, it's not really, but it is, but it gives you the uh, uh, better way of understanding what a bus type of thing is. Now, with the wired buses, uh, it's the same thing, except the signal is contained within a wire. So the signal doesn't travel through the air, but it would be traveling through some sort of a medium. Uh, most of them is, uh, most will be copper. All device, okay, so uh, that's what I just explained. Oh, this is presently 2019, which <laughs> was when I made that PowerPoint. Uh, although the bus topology is not used in LN anymore, there's still, it's still implemented in certain systems. Like for example, this is one of the most simple bus ideas. It will be a fire alarm devices, a zone, which would be on connecting point, And this zone could be named hallway so-and-so, or uh, it could be named uh, elevator shaft, or it could be named whatever, right? uh, another hallway. It is a wire that is connected to an end of line resistor, and the loop is closed here. All those devices are normally open, so nothing happens this zone doesn't even see anything. The only thing it sees is the end of line resistor. If it doesn't see the end of line resistor, it kicks it to a trouble mode and says there's a trouble on the line because I don't see the end of line resistor. But if it's there, the resistor is there, if the system sees that, it means knows that the line is okay. Now, if something happens, there's a smoke or heat or uh, somebody pulls a station, that thing goes into a dead short. So this one sees the short and it's going to announce C8, um, hallway, so-and-so, fire. You know? So that's the, uh, that's the bus type of the simplest way of a uh, bus. Now here, security alarm. All smart devices such as keypads, uh, expansion boards, etc., are connected to a bus terminal. And here is the bus. Right? So here's the auxiliary, plus and minus. That's where the devices are getting the power from. And as long as you don't exceed the current capacity of this output, you can keep connecting the devices to get powered, such as motion sensors, glass break detectors, and others. All right. <clears throat> And over here is a this is green and yellow bus, right? How is that connected? Like this, right? It will be yellow and green, and the red and black would be connected to the, so there's a Z wire, red, black, yellow, green. Um, in telephony, would you would use green and red for one pair and yellow and black for another pair. In the security alarms, you're going to connect black and red to uh, power, you know, and then you're going to connect the yellow and green. Green mostly would be a uh, common, uh, but not always. Um, those keypads are just tapped in in parallel, but they communicate individually with the circuitry that's here. 
So this line is a bus. How are they communicating? Well, different type of modulation is being used uh, and different channels are being established. Uh, different signal protocols are being used that enables them to communicate with this board, main board, simultaneously and transmit different messages. So that's a bus configuration. Inline or chain topology. Difference between inline and chain. Okay, so these switches are connected in a chain topology. Problem with that is, if this link is broken, this switch is not able to communicate with that switch. Now, if this link is broken here, then this switch still can communicate with that one, but it's just going to take a longer way. Right? So this advantage between the, you know, is this being not used? Well, in a rack, so an equipment rack, when you have a bunch of switches, it would be recommended that you use the ring topology, not chain. Is chain being used? Yes, chains are being used in process control units. Uh, so you will have... Um, device, a uh, bunch of machines uh, using PLCs, process logic controls. Uh, there will be one machine, there will be another machine, and so on, there will be another machine. And there will be uh, control devices connected to each other. Okay. Sometimes, and they will just uh, connect, you know, yeah, uh, if something breaks, uh, then uh, this is not going to be able to communicate with that. And sometimes they will be cascaded together in a ring, in one, uh, you know, the control modules. So, so yes, the, uh, the the inline or chain topology, yes, is being used in the industry as well. Those modules are being designed that way. So you just plug in one end to the other. Which type of cable mostly would you prefer to use? UTP or STP? I would probably prefer to use the shielded twisted pair, but sometimes the unshielded twisted pair is being used as well. All right, um, so there's the symbol of the inline or chain topology, topology, all right. Now, I'm going to give you some real life examples here. Workstation and printer, this is connected. These are connected in the star topology. Here's a laptop, here's a switch, they're having connection here and this printer is connected now. The advantage of that is that more than one person can use this printer, more than one station. Printer is on a network, it's in the star topology. Now here, this printer is connected with the inline with the computer. Right. See the difference? Okay, I'm not gonna explain too much, but you, know, you, you should be able to grasp that. Now, another uh, real world example I'm going to give you, inline topology. The Ethernet extender is connected in line with the Ethernet link. Why will we need Ethernet extender? Sometimes the link, and it's just impossible to accomplish a link that is shorter than 300 feet. In that case, you can use a device that's called Ethernet extender. So this link here would be less than 300 feet or 300 feet or less. And this would be 300 feet or less. And uh, you are going to be able to connect an ethernet copper link that is longer than 300 feet. It is possible. And of course, this whole communication is going to be slower, but at least you're going to be able to accommodate a connection. Um, large department stores, for example, they would have um, it would be a large department store, like a hardware store, and they would have a garden center. The garden center is usually somewhere on the parking lot. Uh, so underground wire is you know, going underground, going that way, going that way. It's going to be longer than 300 feet sometimes, end to end. So uh, halfway between, you're going to have a pull box or junction box. You're going to install that Ethernet extender. I had a service call like that years ago, and that was somewhere in Chatham. Problem was, it was the problem. In the garden center, the cash registers, the cash register is basically like a PC, 
right? Uh, it uses Ethernet connection with the mainframe, and that mainframe is connected to the, well, the IDF. The IDF is connected to MDF. MDF is connected to VPN, and it's connected to the main whatever, you know. So there was a, a it was all one of those hardware stores in, in Chatham. The garden center was farther than 300 feet, but nobody knew why. They didn't know. Uh, the symptom was the transactions, the, the communication between the cash register, um, and the transactions would fail. And sometimes they would work, and sometimes they would just trip over their own feet. <coughs> it was an it's a, like it was a hit and miss whether you know somebody swipes their card or pays for something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it would not. So I would just go and take the tester that we have, connect that to one end, connect it to the other, and press the test. And it showed like 360 feet. Now, of course, that's too much length for that link to handle. So some of the data would be lost or the packets were missing or whatnot. So I found that there was a junction box, but the junction box was just patched through. So we ordered an Ethernet extender, plugged it in there, here, plugged it in there, less than 300 feet here, less than 300 feet here, uh, the, the, the transactions don't use, don't need that much speed because it just get a couple of numbers shoot that way, right? You're not transmitting a high definition motion picture, right? So it doesn't matter the speed, but what was what really mattered was actually solid connection, right? So that's uh, sometimes you would use ethernet connections or ethernet extenders. Uh, how are they powered? they powered sometimes through POE, power over ethernet, right? which means that the cable, the ethernet cable is transmitting not only the signal, but simultaneously the signals, uh, the wires are carrying, uh, usually we have 48 volt DC. Some of them will be 24, but standard is 48, but sometimes they're different. Uh, so a PoE, so you don't need to have a power for that because if this is a PoE capable switch, PoE compatible, which means those ports also have the PoE imposed power over ethernet through the cable, this one gets its power because this is not a passive device, it is an active device, which means it has to work being plugged in. If you don't plug it into power, it's not going to work, it's an active device. Uh, so. <clears throat> So it's getting powered from the PoE and it's just passing the signal through both directions. Okay. Ethernet extender connected in line. Okay. Uh, this PoE injector is connected in line with the wireless access point. Uh, sometimes you would have an existing network um, that employs, uh, that implements a switch that doesn't have a capability because some of the less expensive, you know, if you want the switch to be PoE, power over ethernet switch, you gotta pay more money, you know? And sometimes you pay halfway more because you know some, some of those only like first eight ports are gonna have PoE and the rest of them not. And sometimes none of them do because that's the way it was installed maybe six years ago or something like that, right? But then somebody decides to add a wireless access point in the ceiling for the customer's Wi-Fi. And so what are you going to do? You're going to have to power it up somehow. And sometimes you'll be able to plug it into the wall through a power adapter and just plug it in just like your laptop. But this is a ceiling. You're going to call the electrical crew or something and just you know have an in outlet installed in the ceiling. No you're just going to spend a little bit more money and put the PoE injector, right? So one side of that goes to the ethernet port that is not PoE, and then this plugs into the outlet, which would be somewhere in the rack, you would have that. So that's powered, it's an active device. And then it injects the PoE onto that port and it lets that wireless access point being powered. So all you have to do, plug in, is just the ethernet port, ethernet cable, and the, the signal and the power is going to go through that. I'm giving you some live examples. This is from our assignment, inline topology. This VoIP telephone is connected inline with the PC. When you switch over to the VoIP sometimes, <clears throat> you just disregard completely the existing phone jack, 
and using the network. Remember, we have to have cat 5 e uh, minimum for that. And you're just going to unplug the computer from the wall and you're going to plug in the phone and from the other side, you're going to plug into the computer uh, and, and, and that's how things are going to work. And uh, you're not going to see much of a difference in the you know, speed, especially when uh, it's like a hardware store or department store connections, very popular in the store connections. If anybody works for like a Rona, Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that, you're going to see that set up a lot. Okay? Uh, consider PC 0, 1, and 2. Are the PCs connected in ring configuration? No. They're connected in a star configuration. These three PCs are connected in a star configuration to the switch. All right. Now, or is it a star? It's a star. Physically, it looks like a star configuration, and it is can this system work as a ring? And if so, then how, okay? Okay, here is how. I'm pretty sure you're dying to know that one. Uh, all right, so here is a system that is connected in a star topology. There's a switch and there end user is connected in a star. So it's, yeah, it's gonna be working as a star system right? typically is a star yeah logical topology so physical topology and a logical topology look at that it can be a star or it could be a can be a ring depending on how this is configured internally so even though these are physically connected as a star, they can the information that passes through can be configured as ring. Very rare thing, and it's if you get to work in this field installing networks, this is something you're never going to be tested on or asked to do. I just want you to know the kind of difference. Uh, that's the best way of visualizing the difference between the physical topology and the logical topology. Right? or signal routing topology right so that would that this is how the signal would travel and then you would have you'll be able to use the single nick but if you got physical ring topology or token ring uh, you would have to have the double nick double port nick network interface card but this is how the connection physical connection is in star and the signal will be traveling in the ring topology right? not that useful information, but it visual, it gives you a visual of how things, you know, live validation, structured cabling. This is the patch panel. Remember, these are a bunch of jacks, but cascaded and organized in one metal piece. This is what the patch panel looks like on the other side. Remember, each jack has the 110 punch down terminals. So this is the other side. So here's blue, green, orange, brown, blue, orange, green, brown, or blue. So here's the A configuration. Uh, here's the A configuration here. And here's the B configuration for this particular jack. And on the other side, it will be connected to one of those. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So there's just a bunch of jacks stuck together. And on the other side, the terminals that correspond to those jacks are also stuck together. This is the Ethernet jack or a data jack. And here is a couple of cables. This would be a CAT5E cable, or this would be, you know, it could be CAT6 cable. You don't see it on the zoom thing, but maybe you see a little bit of a separator here. Um, the CAT5E doesn't have a separator. The pairs are just thrown in there and they have a nice twist to them. The purpose of a twist is to eliminate crosstalk. And the twists are different pairs are being twisted at different rates so that uh, the elimination of a crosstalk is even, even more effective. Now, not only in CAT6, not only the pairs are twisted, there's a little tighter twist, you can notice, but also it has a separator and those se the separator has grooves in it. So the pairs are also being twisted uh, not only within themselves, but are also twisted in certain way around each other. That's how you can get more signal, more data, uh, faster data. 
Insulation, display, uh, insulation Displacement Connection, IDC. Here you can read the history of that. What it is, here's a wire and it's an insulated wire. We saw that in one of the videos. You push that wire into a knife-like type of a connector. That connector bites into the insulation and makes contact with the wire inside. Now, I got this thing from an internet and somebody did that, uh, they visualized a stranded wire. IDC is meant for a solid wire. Yeah simply because if you bite into an insulation, make a contact, there is a possibility of you cutting some of those strands. So solid wire works with the IDC, very popular connection, right? So this is wrong here, but uh, now you know how to make it right. There's an example of uh, punch down uh, RG45 or uh, ethernet uh, jack. Okay, now one more thing, one more thing. Termination types. That's a short one here. Oh, come on. Termination types. I should say the IDC termination types. The uh, cable termination is uh, the connection of two wire or fiber. Okay, connection of a connection of the wire or fiber to a device. It's a termination. Okay. Uh, such as equipment, panels, or wall outlet, which allows for connecting the cable to other cables or devices. You know, the Types of connection, insulation displacement. That's what we're talking about. Here's the picture again. Here's a picture again. Here's a picture again. So it's a repeat here. General overview. Uh, two most common punch down platforms are used uh, in North America. This will be 110 and BIX. We have worked with both. Remember, we used BIX to uh, uh, punch down platform to uh, terminate the 25 pair cable, the cut three telephony. And we used 110 termination to terminate the Ethernet jacks. It's just how things have settled on the market. Uh, if you end up working in telecommunications, you will see also something that's called 66 blocks as part of the existing old installations. The 66 system is still widely used in USA. Uh, so if you get an installation contract from the company located south of the border, you might get, you might find a 66 block shipped to you. You can decide what to do with it. The most common practice is recycling the 66 block and replacing it with the BIX system. That's what we do here in Canada, uh, most of the time. Uh, there are many punch down platforms. The shapes and the forms might vary. The purpose is one, to organize the field wiring in a permanent and systematic way. If you have a permanent connection on one side and there's a wire going inside the wall and you have a permanent connection on the other side that's physically mounted, you have a solid connection. You can plug a tester onto one side and the other side you can do a test and you can save the results because that thing it doesn't move. Where you connect the other things, you use patch cords to plug in, but that link is tested, certified, and it's uh, basically it's, it works as it should. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so it can be easily cross-connected to various points of a cabling structure. Physical permanent cabling structure makes it possible for the cable runs to be tested and or certified. Okay. Uh, this way, the cross-connecting changes will not affect the physical structure of the permanently installed cabling, uh, which is what I said. Here's a BIX example. That's what the BIX head looks like. We worked with that. We are actually evaluated on that. Uh, and here is the example of a BIX termination. We did that during our lab. One 10 down punch down tool. That looks like this. It has a stationary knife. The knife doesn't move. It's just embedded in this whole structure. Remember the BIX has a knife that moves. Now uh, it has also a different shape of the head. We should never exchange. If it's a punch down platform that's BIX, you use the BIX punch down tool. If it's a punch down platform that's 110, use the 110 punch down tool. If it's another one, use accordingly. You choose, the, you choose things accordingly because uh, the shapes are a little bit different. In order to get a proper punch down, you need to use the 
proper punch down tool that corresponds with the platform they're using. And that's an example of a 110 punch down. Uh, 66, that's the head for 66. The 66 blocks look like this. And uh, they have different connections because usually they are, okay, some of them are just connected all the way through. So there is a connector, here's a connector, here's a connector, here's a connector, and they're connected all the way through. And <clears throat> some um, uh, sometimes they're just, these two are connected with each other and there's break here. And these two are connected with each other. And if you want to connect those, so you, you would just punch down here and punch down here. So there's a pair and a pair here pair from this side and pair from that side. So it'd be one and the other, and the other one and the other side of the pair. And you use the jumper clips. Uh, there's a metal piece that you just slide on to make a connection. Okay, So that's how the um, uh, 66 punch down works. Uh, sometimes if you are running, you know, I didn't say that, and it's like not going to be on the record, like, wow, it's going to be on YouTube all over the place. Have, uh, you know, was somebody that I know, you know, found guilty of using needle nose pliers to shove those wires in. I know a person or two. Yeah. Uh, then there's a cron, right? It looks very similar to the uh, Bix or combination or uh, um, um, it's a combination of Bix and 110, right? It has a moving knife here. Yeah. Mostly you're going to see that in Europe and uh, you know UK uh, as well. It's, it's mostly in UK, but actually some of the European Union countries they're going to. It's a very popular uh, system here too. Oh, um, and the platform looks like this. The advantage of cron because you know in the Bix and 110 you can only use one wire per connection. With the cron you can stack wires on top of each other it's like a little bit more efficient that way uh, yeah, but we're not using this thing uh europe mostly is using that elimination examples here's the bix remember here's the bix uh, there are bix mounts there are uh, frames uh, there are connectors there are 25 pair cables there are four pair cables that terminated and they're cross connected with the cross connect wire okay 110 example, that would be an example of termination of 110. It would be data jacks, data jacks, data jacks, right? Uh, so that's 110. That's what mostly you're going to look, see. Uh, 66, I took a picture of one of the service calls that I did, uh, but it's, it was an old, old installation, but it was a huge facility, amazingly huge. The whole thing worked as a phone system uh, and the phone connections. So uh, it was left like that. Uh, so if somebody wants to uh, you know, connect, make any connections, you're going to use toners to sniff out the tones from the wires. If you want to connect, uh, if you want to connect a toner to some outlet that's in one of the stores, you come back here with the with the sniffer or the um, the probe, and you're going to listen to that tone on proximity. And when you zero in, uh, you're going to find that wire. Sometimes you can find it pretty quickly, but this is a huge. There's like a thousand wires going in there. So that's a 66 example. See how big that is. The the you can um, uh, you can substitute the whole thing with a one wall of Bix uh, terminations. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's the end of this uh, today's lecture. Uh, next time we're going to talk about the fiber optics, um, and that's going to be pretty much it. Uh, how are you, how are you guys doing with the assignment? Um, I have seen some people have submitted the assignments. It's pretty good. I was able to give some feedback on some of that. Now, right now, I'm able to give you the feedback when you submit the assignment. So here's the bonus situation for you. You submit the assignment early right now. Uh, I'm going to be able to give you the feedback. But when you submit the assignment late, the only thing I'll be able to do is just mark it and give you the mark. Right? So um, here's the little bit of a thing. The early bird gets uh, warm or something, you know, something like that. All right. If you have any questions or whatever, you know how to find me. You know how to talk to me. Is there any immediate uh, business that we need to take care of? Not really. Everybody wants to just go and have a sip of coffee. I know I want to have a sip of coffee because my throat is getting dry. Uh, talking for like 
two hours and 45 minutes right now. Okay, cool. I'll see you when I see you. Love you. You're special. Bye.